Morning. Morning. Hey. I like your shirt. It's a luau shirt. I like it. Cool. Yeah, it's a very comfortable shirt, actually. Man, I miss Aloha shirts. It's freezing over here. Where are you? I am in uh, Reno right now, and it's like sunny, but somehow still freezing. Getting close to winter. Ooh. Okay. Um, How are things I in Reno? they're they're pretty good not too bad um I'm excited yeah um i had a question though i did um end up put turning in a couple like revised versions of my minute medical and um is there like an opportunity for like my first submission to be regraded at all or am i sort of stuck with my first grade no there's um the first two assignments have a, you can have a second submission. Okay. Did you try and submit it? Yeah, it should be the one. I think I submitted it on October 13th. I dated it, um, but that's like my final submission for um, Minute Medical. I just wanted to like shout that out. Um, Cause yeah, I wasn't, my first submission was sort of wonky and. Let I, me look at it. Um, okay. And you submitted it in the assignments? Yeah, it should be through my um, like my Dropbox or thingy. Well, they're different things. Um, Let me see, I can um, music. So, um, Yeah, it's my um, full revised minute medical Madison Gill, the final revision, October 3rd. That okay. Is... So, um, let me look at the last submission you have in the assignments was October 1st. Oh, in assignments. Yeah, so I see you put it in in your Dropbox. Um, I'm going to, so anyway, you should be able to submit it in the assignments tool, okay? So I'm on the assignments tool, and I don't see any way to submit anything. It just says, um, <laughs> yeah, let me, I'll share my screen real fast. Um, so, like I'm on assignments and it's just this blank screen. I don't know if you guys are seeing that. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's not good. Yeah. So I've been submitting everything through my Dropbox tool. Um, okay. Stop sharing for a second. Okay. Okay. I, oh, um, let me look at that. That's not good. Um, This is Minute Medical, right? Yeah. Oh, 
That's really strange. Um, it should accept assignments until October 30th. Hmm. I don't, I don't really know why I'm not seeing any. I don't know either. Um, And then I had another question about um, the new um, assignment as well. Can you refresh your page yeah. in your assignments? Mm -hmm. I just reopened it. <clears throat> Let me view this as a student if I can. Oh, you know what it is? It is um, I think it was on the wrong page. I was on assignments, tests, and surveys. You have a separate assignments tool, okay. So, okay, so then I can, file. okay, I'm going to update it right now. Let's see. Yeah, I'm gonna. There's quite a bit to go over on the um, funky music, if that's what you mean. Yeah, I um. Let's see. I was on the ninth. Four ways to open. Oh wow. Um. Yeah, I um. I kind of missed what you were doing last class. Um, and. Is it just under resources where you um, hold? All yeah, those let me go tabs? back with you a second. So are you seeing the assignment? Are you able to submit? Yeah, I think I, I just went back into that um, assignment. Tab. Okay. Yeah, I put my revised one on there. Yeah, so it, it, it it's really difficult for me to have all this stuff in your Dropbox. Um, okay. So the things that I can, I want to, I'm going to start using the um, assignments and possibly the tests and quizzes for the chapter assignments from now on. Mm -hmm. Just because, it, it, um, you know, this course wasn't intended to be online, so I didn't set it up that way. And it's really it's just real time consuming for me to go through your drop boxes and see what's there. Um, part of the problem too is a lot of students are not submitting work and it's really, uh, it's not good. Um, and all I can say is if you have, if you have an issue with the course um, and if there's a way I can make it better for you, don't wait to the end to speak up. Um, you know, it's hard. This is a recording class and it's the first time I've done it without recording. Um, but we're going to just focus on mixing until I have some other idea. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm, I am opening up the microphone assignment is our new one. Um, so it's a big chapter and an important one. Um, I'll try and prepare some demonstrations next week on different microphone types. Um, it'll be really good if you can all read the chapter. Um, I, I revised the, uh, the written assignment this week and I, I put in more, um, more page references for you. Um, it's just a lot. So on a lot of the questions, you know, you'll see like page 222 or something, and that'll help guide you to where I'm getting the information. Uh, you know, these assignments aren't designed to be difficult because, you know, they're, they're tricky or anything. You know, I just want you to focus on what's important. Um, 
So I am extending some of the accept until dates on these things. Um, but you know, if we can, it's really good if we can kind of stay together on the assignments in class. Otherwise, I'm, you know, I want to demonstrate some of these things, especially the the you know this funky music is quite a bit more complex, just in the track count. Um, anyway, um, I think that you making your presentations is a really important part of the class, you know, if we're going to do it this way. Um, so I, I really want to do that. And um, I've opened up a gradebook item for that. Um, and it's going to be, I think I gave it like 10, it's under a participation heading. So I'm making a change in that. Um, and it'll be um, a percentage of your grade, like maybe 10 or 15% in lieu of participation in recording. So I, I hope you think that's fair and reasonable. Um, and I'm doing it like I do my recitals in uh, my instrument classes. And you know, to take the, the stress off of it, you get maximum points just for doing it. Okay. Sure. So, um, you know, in the presentation, um, you should sort of be doing what I'm doing, where um, you're going to look at your settings for equalization and compression and just make, you should talk about uh, why you're doing it. What is it you're hearing and what's the goal you have in making the settings you have? Um, that's it. You should, you should have a reason for it. Um, and we'll look at it. Hopefully it'll make sense. If not, we'll try and get you on track. Um, and you'll end up with a really good mix because of it. Um, same for EQ settings. Okay. Sounds good. I found a shortcut in GarageBand. I don't know if any of you noticed this, but um, oh, let me share my screen here. Sorry. If I ever am not sharing my screen and, and uh, try to remind me, uh, it's it's really tiny. This thing I have to look at. Um, are you seeing my garage band now? Yes. Okay. So. Um, this tab on the top, um, the top left, let me just get this and see if a student is trying to get in, okay? My phone's ringing. Hello? This is a message? <laughs> Guess not. Hmm. Social security office or something. Um, this library, you can save different settings, and you may have noticed that they have some presets for different things. Um, if you set up, like I'm going to go to my kick drum. Um, I set this up with a noise gate last class. Should I review that? Yes, please. All right, I'll review that today, but let's go, let's just take this is our standard setting for a channel, right? Um, we want to have a, we want our channel EQ, morning, followed by our AU multiband. And we have a preset for this. Uh, I called mine two band. And this is a default setting with just the two bands and the, the threshold is set at zero. So it's not doing anything. And you know, make sure you're looking at the two visible bands, which we set up to be two and three. Um, is everyone good with this setting? 
okay? Um, you might want to adjust the crossover point a little bit depending on the track, and we'll look at that. So anyway, this is my basic channel setting. If you go to your, open your library like this, there's a save button at the bottom. If you click that, once the wheel stops spinning, Um, I've already saved this. I don't know if you can see it. It's, it's kind of grayed out. Just, um, but I, I named it EQ and Multi, and GarageBand adds this dot patch to it, so it's a, it's a setting. I'm going to cancel this um, just because I don't want to save it twice. But if I go to my guitar channel now, oh, I did that already. Let's go to... Um, I did these already. Like here's on my clavinet channel. This is my default setting that GarageBand gives it, a noise gate, compressor channel EQ. If you go to user patches now, highlight the channel, user patches, EQ and multi, click on it. It snaps to it and you load in the whole thing. Mine is changing the name of my like instruments when I do that. And I think you had the same issue last class. How did you get around that? It's changing your instruments. Yeah. Like if I, if I go into my user patches and I click my EQ and multi, it will change it to like, if I set it, um, I set my EQ, um, and compressor on like the B4 thing and then if i click on that for any of my other instruments it changes it to b4 before so i'm losing like bass clavinet kick all that really just, yeah i think you have the same issue did you not i'm not i mean i loaded that in on my clavinet i think mm. i did I guess I could just like type in the names manually, but it just makes it complicated. Um, I actually, I don't know where my clavinet is now. Wow. Let me undo that. Oh, it's there. Oh, it does change the name. I'm take back what I said. Let me look at that some more. Sorry about that. No, it's cool. I'm just like um, changing the names manually and keeping the patch. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Wow, I didn't notice that. Um, okay. Um, So um, if, if everyone's loaded up with funky music, I'll, I'll start working on a couple things. No audio is coming out of your tracks? Hang on, everyone. I got to troubleshoot a computer here. Sorry. We match the volumes up. Yeah. The yeah. up. Only thing I was thinking would be the references. Well, okay, we'll play it. I mean, you can use it. You know what? I figured out how to get around that issue too. Oh, to please tell us. Um, so if you highlight the name um, of your track, like you're going to change the name and then go to your user patches and click EQ and multi, it won't change the name. So you can see the changing, but you have to like actually 
You see what I'm doing? Yeah, double uh, click and yeah. Yep, that's it. Brilliant. Gotcha. Yeah, we'll promote you to teaching assistant. Please don't. I'm. I'm. I'm so we solved the computer problem here. It was a fader off issue. Okay. Um, So I want to cover, um, Liz, were you here when I was talking earlier? We lost her. Oh yeah, I was here. I had to go get my book. So you heard that we're doing the microphone assignment this week? I did, I got that. Okay, so it's there. Um, again, you don't need to submit it, but I'm gonna, we'll talk about it in class and I'll, I'll answer any questions. During the week, if you see something you'd like demonstrated, try to give me a heads up and, and I'll do it. Um, whether it's a microphone type, a distance, any, anything. Okay, I'll, uh, the microphone chapter is really important, but it, it's just kind of tough because uh, ideally I'd like to have you in the studio and we'd plug them in. We have got a great microphone collection here at the college. Um, and I feel like we need to get a, a, a redo in this next semester for, for some of us for free, just so we could see that studio. Um, I'm open to doing that. And I'm also open to, you know, in lieu of some class meetings, if any, if we could um, schedule a meeting in the studio or we can do my studio. Um, if we have a small group, I, I think we can do it and meet the distancing guidelines we need to. So, yeah, I'm, before we had a studio at the college, I used to always bring the students to my studio and sometimes I, we'd split the class in half, you know, cause we, you know, we're having like, I think that's a great idea because, you know, I did, I, that was kind of the part I was looking for when I signed up for the class. Because I'm not really going for a grade. I'm really going for knowing what's going on. Okay. So what do you think, what are you missing out on? I'd like to see the mics. I'd like to see the studio. I'd like to watch, you know, and, and mm -hmm. get more hands on. Like I'm working with my garage band, mm -hmm. but um, I, I, I had some problems because my overnight, my computer totally rebooted uh, and downloaded a new OS. So now I'm scrambling right now to try to find everything that I had and didn't have a chance to download the new music. So I, I don't know. I just feel like if we were doing it the way you normally would, we would get a different kind of hands-on experience. Yeah, no, it really is. I mean, especially when I have a class with, with you know, some good musical talent in it. Like it, like four or five students, we really can produce songs in class. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm missing out on that part. Well, anyway, yeah, I. If you want to, I don't know if we'll be able to meet face to face, but when we do, I'm open for you. You know, coming in on that. You know, and anyone else for that matter, because uh, I I want you to have that experience. And, you know, I want to say, if you want to bring your board in and we'll hook it up here one day and we'll try and uh, get someone to, um, you know, video it and help with the Zoom, um, you know, we, we can do some of that. I, I don't at least really see how it works if people can see. Okay. Um, is yours USB or Firewire? Um, you know, I honestly haven't set that up yet. I've got a smaller board that I think I might be using with this um, computer. I just ordered a new desktop and, and things like that. I haven't really set up a mixing board. Mm -hmm. and, and then the um, one I had that I was thinking about using, 
I've been using for live things. So I, I, you know, it's kind of a drag to set it up, break it down and take it out to the gig and then bring it back. So I'm working on streamlining it. So I do have one designated mixing board. And right now I was looking at the, uh, I have a four channel Yamaha that I've also used for live situations that I'm not using too much now, but then suddenly I found that I might have to use it for an upcoming event. But that was, um, I think that one, okay, when you say Firewire, that's that's more square. Again, I think it's USB. I have a USB into my computer, not Firewire. Yeah, they're not even, they're not making computers with Firewire anymore. Um, but some of the early PreSonus ones, um, have it. Um, it used to be faster than USB, but that's not true anymore. Um, but yeah, the, the, the newer USB formats are, have plenty of bandwidth to, to stream a hundred tracks, uh, you know, or more. Um, it's really a lot of bandwidth for your moving your audio back and forth. Um, but anyway, I'd, I'd like to do that. Um, I mean, I did mine in class, my, my little six or eight channel one. Yeah, I did a gig yesterday. I played at the airport. First time I've played in public in eight months. Jeez. How was that? How was that? <laughs> Um, I, I actually, I really enjoyed it. I played with two musicians uh, that I play with at the old behind a luau. That's what it was for. They had us play. So I, I played with Kahala Grieg and Kalena Foster. You know them. So they're they're great. Um, but I got to play steel guitar. But um, but. It was deserted here at the airport at the baggage claim where we played. They have a nice stage there now. I guess mm -hmm. upstairs they had the big line where people were waiting for the, how do you call it? The unauthorized test. <laughs> now, does that make sense? No. Anyway, it's kind of crazy here with all that. Um, anyway, I, I don't want to, I'm going to get focused here. Um, so to catch up, some of you are still missing your your voice and minute medical. Um, I hope you're prepared to do a presentation today on some of your work. Um, we, we can split things up and do some now, or I will. I can work on some drums and things on funky music. Okay, I was saying that. This, the presentations are a graded thing. Um, so you can share your screen out there, or if you want, you can shoot it over to me in your Dropbox and I can play it and you can talk about it, or it's probably better if you do it yourself. Um, I forgot my USB stick anywhere. Oh, on your um, in a real world it could be on your desktop. Um, yeah, I don't want to stop the class for that right now. Can, oh, okay. can can you work on this with us? Yeah. Yeah. Let me so just find. A, um, okay, I'm sorry, Koa. I'll do it. If you oh. want to do it, I'm sorry, students. Give me a second. I uh, actually, I'll show what I'm doing. Maybe worth knowing. Yeah. So, uh, sharing a file. Um, Koa, let me share my screen here. Maybe you can learn something from this. Um, I'm going to share my desktop. Um, is this on my desktop, Koa? Oh, it, this is it in a real world? Yeah. Okay. So Koa needs a copy of his project. You'll get to this one. Uh, 
Um, I'll zip it for you first. File, compress in a real world. And when that's ready, I'm going to go to the Dropbox. And find Koa's. There you are. I'm going to do upload files. I'm going to just drop it in this area. It's almost done compressing. That's it in a real world zip. Oops. Want to get position the windows so that I can see them both. Grab it, drop it in there. I'm not sure why it's not showing me this continue. Yeah. That's odd. Oh. I'm getting a spinning wheel still. Um, that's really strange. I'll try this again. I'll remove the first one. File is too big. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. That's not good. I think that... Um, I think La Lima has a file size limit. So let me try something else here. Um, if you go to transfer files, um, La Lima has a way to to use it like a FTP site. Um, I'm going to click on my Mac icon. And this is the FTP address here. Step one, select the following URL, copy it to your clipboard. Hello? Why don't you let me do it? Darn it, nothing's working today. There I go. I'm going to do Command C. Select your operating system. And now on the map, you want to go to your desktop and under the Go menu, connect to server. I'm going to paste this in, Command V. So this is the FTP site for this course, hopefully. Um, so it's asking me for my name and password. So you can do this if you have a file that's really big, you know, and you're getting this error. Um, my password. I thought the zip file compresses it, though. It, it did smaller. compress it, but it's still too big. I don't know. Um, Hopefully this will work. <clears throat> I'm opening up Koa's folder here. I'm trying to. I've never done this before. All right, let's try this. I hope you're all seeing this. Um, I need another window. I find this on the desktop. So I, under file, you can do new finder window. 
gives you a second window, desktop in a real world COA. Hopefully I can drag this and drop it in there. Oops. Very good. Is this going to show up in the Dropbox? It should. So this will take a minute. Everyone get what I did? If not, it's, it's going to be in the Zoom recording. So yeah, this is 286 megabyte zipped. Good. The other thing you can do, um, you know, to send me a file, because some of these are going to start getting too big, um, is to submit uh, it to your college um, Google Drive. I'm not going to take time to do that now, but I will if we need to. Okay? That should work, Koa. All right. Very good. Um, would anyone like to present a project now who ha needs to? I sent out an email. Um, look in your grade book, and I know some of you have done this already. Um, but if you did it and didn't get credit, let me know. Actually, I think all of you have. Madison, Liz, and Luke. OK. So that's a negative. No one wants to present a project now? Um, I would, but I don't, I don't really have anything. OK, well, let's, you know, it'll be really good if we can make it part of the course. Um, otherwise, you're going to just listen to me talk about my stuff. Um, when it comes to like new projects and stuff, I, I totally think it's a good idea to, you know, like work on it together in class with presentations because that helps clear up a lot of things. Okay. So I'm going to work on funky music today. We started it a little bit. Does anyone need a moment to load it up? I do. I've had um, some computer rebooting things and I explained it in an email to you, but um, I'll need a few minutes, but just carry on. Just don't call on me. Okay. Do you know how to do it? I'm it's my computer. I kind of, yeah, I might be, I can click and drag and I remember that part, but it's my computer that's having issues because everything's all over the place. It, uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm really frustrated with Apple. I'm, I'm having similar problems to it. I'm, I'm kind of in limbo. It's like I have some programs that are too old to work. And then there's other things that I want that are too new to work. And Apple refuses to like support um, some old stuff. For example, my computer will no longer recognize my iPhone, which I use to load, you know, backing tracks when I do like a solo thing. And yet I have a PC in the house too. And it'll work with that, but so it'll work on a PC, but Apple won't even support their own stuff. And they just want you to force you to buy new things. And I, I don't like it. In some ways, I'm kind of done with Apple. Um, their upgrades just tend to cripple applications and they make things worse. Um, Anyway, I'm a little frustrated with it. Um, so does anyone need to, besides Liz, need help opening up funky music? You guys are good with it here? Everyone here in the classroom? Yeah. yeah. OK. You know, the other thing to consider is if, if you want to be here and do it with Zoom, 
Uh, I don't know if that's a good thing. Um, anyway, I'm going to go to this. Um, I started some of this and I'll review it quickly. Um, but I was suggesting that you, um, you know, group, start grouping your tracks. Um, when you work on a big project, it's really important to be organized. Um, GarageBand forces you to look at all the tracks. Um, other software um, lets you, um, you know, hide things that you don't need to see or work in groups. But I like to keep, um, I started with the drums on this song. Um, just there's a lot of instruments and I, I don't feel like I can mix the vocals without some foundation. Um, so I'm choosing to start with uh, instruments first. Um, I think when you have drums, you need to start with the drums. Um, you know, something like establishes a bass line, you know, that you're mixing to for both tone and level. Um, I got in the habit of using hi-hat, kick, snare. Uh-oh. It changed the name of these tracks. I'm going to undo this load patch. These are the overheads, I believe, but it changed them to guitar. Um, um, I've been doing these plugins. Let me just check this track. Sorry. <coughs> This is an overhead. I'm, it's, I'll call it OH right. I panned it right. This is, this is overhead left, rename track. OHL. I think I'm back on track. Um, the hi-hat we can, uh, I, I'm not, the important things are the kick drum and the snare first. So I work on those first. I have a, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so back when we were going in and um, putting those patches on all of the tracks, um, I noticed that like my B4, when I click on my um, multi-bands and go to like my default setting, it's bands two and three split near like the 192. And then when I go to the rest of my tracks and check the multi-bands, it looks like it's band three and four that I have on there. And it looks like for some reason it shifted all of those to different bands. Is that gonna mess me up or do I need to go in and manually do band one, band two? Um or two or three. Let me try this again. So I'm on my B4. I'm going to hit rename. I'm going to go to my library. I'm going to do user patches, EQ multi. Change the and name. Change the name. Yeah, I don't, I don't like that. But yeah, anyway, yeah, that could mess you up. But okay, it's, so it's a real simple fix. Yeah. Um, here, let me set this up. I'm on my B4 track and I'll show you what to do. Um, if you can see this down here. Um, you know, set up your channel, get rid of the compressor, pull your channel EQ to the top. Bring in your AU multiband. Call in your preset. Um, and, you know, your band one is hiding here and your band four is hiding there. You should have gone through this and make sure I'm clicking on band two. Make sure your threshold is at zero for all these. Okay, we want a default setting. Um, 
and then pull the band one off out of range, pull band four out of range. Um, you know, you might want to adjust, uh, you know, your crossover band depending on your track. For example, um, you know, guitar, where we have a lot of the low mid-range energy at like maybe 300 and below, you know, you might want to deal with those bands separately. Um, for like a higher vocal part, um, you know, it might be higher. Mm -hmm. uh, for bass or something like that, you actually might want to use an additional band. So I hope you're comfortable now in using more bands. Like for the bass guitar, you might, the real lows, are going to be like at a hundred and below, you know, you'd have a mid range, you know, maybe between a hundred and 600 and then a higher range. Um, but yeah, it's pretty, you know, pretty simple to set up and most of you were getting the hang of it. You know, none of these tracks need more than three dB of compression. Some of the stuff you're sending in, some of you are over compressing tracks. Like I'm seeing bands that are like down by six and eight dB and I, I hear it being squashed. Um, but anyway, so do you know what to do? Madison? Yeah, I fixed it. All okay. right. But I'll, I'll get back to our default thing. Um, I'm on the, I'm starting with the kick drum. So I'm, I have everything else muted. Disc is too slow. Can you hear my audio well enough? Mm -hmm. Okay. So for the kick drum, we did some work on this. And I set up the noise gate, which I will bypass that. I'll, let me review this. I'm trying to open up my editor so you can see this. I don't know why this isn't showing. It should be. Darn it. This should be showing here. That's a glitch. I don't know why it didn't. So you can see on the waveform what's happening. These big spikes of the kick drum and this little thing is the snare bleed. Um, Oh, I'm at the end. Jump ahead. So yes, um, last week in class, I went into the kick drum track and I manually deleted the hiding snare. Does everyone remember that? I see some benefit of being able to process the kick drum in this track um, separately without affecting the bleeding snare. Um, and the track is so clean and the way he played it um, is pretty clean, so we can do it. But the fast, these are the two ways to do it. One is to do it manually. So again, the way I did that, like if there's my snare bleed, I can highlight it and just hit delete, right? You could tediously go through the track like that, which wouldn't take that long, right? Everyone see what I'm doing? That's a yes? Yeah. Okay, so. I want to get this to if you have to you have to turn on this um, wiper um, icon and then the the 
the editing window will play in sync with the track on top. So let me open up the effects. Um, so try this. It's really a good, a good opportunity for you to see how a noise gate works. So I brought it in. I'll open it up. Unfortunately, this one has terrible metering. Um, it's a not, it's just a primitive graphic. Um, the DB is the threshold um, of where it's going to shut the gate. It works, um, the DB readout is similar to what you see in a compressor, only what this, the gate does is it's going to keep it quiet um, above the threshold. Like if I put it at minus 100, which is essentially off. Um, you're going to always hear the snare, but if you bring it up uh, and you can see the slider moving there, um, if you enable it. Once you get it um, um, above minus 20, um, you're going to be gating the um, snare. Does everyone get what it's, what's happening here? So essentially, you don't really have to go in and delete that snare if you put this noise gate on? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so it's a good way to control, you know, the bleed in this case that it's undesirable, I think. Um, okay, so I hope everyone gets what the noise gate is doing. Um, but of course, you know, we have the snare track on its own. Um, let me go back to the kick drum. Channel EQ, I forget if I, yeah, I did some EQ on this. Um, this is my curve now, here's without it, I'll bypass it. It's kind of lifeless and dull, but, um, This, um, my boost here at around 65, I chose that because if, if I, when I look at the, um, the graphic representation of the frequencies, that's the center of the fundamental tone of the drum, right? You can see this, this little, this mountain here. Hey, down. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so I wanted a little more thump. I hope it sounds okay. I'm sitting behind my speakers here. Um, but then I wanted a, some snap on the beater too. And I experimented and I found that at around 2K. Okay. Um, I've got a lot of guitars and the organ and some vocals. So I, I brought down some of that energy in the kick drum, you know, between two and 500. Um, so yeah, a lot of people sort of scoop out the mids in the kick drum. Um, even if it sounds a little odd on its own, um, it can help make room if you have a pretty dense track. Um, so that's my EQ on the kick drum for now. Um, from my multi-band. I used all four bands on the kick drum. Band one. It helps just smooth out the performance on a close mic. Um, not much going on above 4,000 on this, so you're not going to see much. Um, but as you can see, I just have like 2 dB of compression, you know, on this. Okay, band three, band two. Okay. Everyone
everyone good with that? Mm -hmm. All right. Kick drum is super important in a pop track. Um, let's move to the snare drum next. Um, let me shut that off. Um, oops. So this is without my EQ. I did this in class. Uh, let me just check if the student's trying to get in. Hello? This is an automated. <laughs> I'm just getting full of spam calls today. I'm not going to do that anymore. Um, so here's my EQ on the snare. To me, again, this is um, the snare drum is mic'd from the top with an SM57 microphone. This is the way most people do it. Um, if you've got the space, um, and, you know, in live sound, people will add a mic to the bottom, which picks up the snare. Does everyone understand how, what a, how a snare drum works? Would anyone like a quick explanation? Um, sure. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I wonder if, let me see if I can, see if I can get a picture. Um, see if I can get a snare drum and see if I can Google an in image. Um, this is a snare drum. The microphone, let me see if I can get a picture of the bottom. I'll, sh I'll look Google a bottom picture. There's lots of different kinds, lots of different materials. Oh, here we go. So this is the top, it's a drum head. And on the bottom, this is the snare. And it's a there's they're all pretty much the same idea but it's it's like a wire screen and it's stretched across the bottom head there's a lever on this thing here that tightens it like you can release it so you can get it actually becomes like a tom tom um they use that in reggae sometimes you know and what happens is when you hit the top head, the bottom head vibrates as well because of the compression of the top head. Um, but it's pretty much out of phase with it on the hit. But anyway, it makes this piece of metal bounce against the bottom head and it adds this real crispness to the sound. Um, so it's a super important part of the drum but you don't really hear it if you have a microphone that's like two inches from the top head. So um, a lot of times, you know, if you, like I said, if you have the mixer channels uh, and if you have a setup where it can make a difference, um, you can put a microphone that picks up the bottom head. Um, sometimes I've had success with the vent Snare drums have a, a hole in the side, like that's it here. And it's to let the air release out of it when you hit it. If you don't, it's, it's, it would be like so airtight that it would resist having the head vibrate and it would really sound like a piece of cardboard that was really muffled. I've had success putting a microphone by the vent and it can really pick up the sound of the shell, the top and bottom head. It just, you know, you need to, to work with the positioning of it a little bit. Um, in my, um, the software I use for drums in my studio called Superior Drummer, um, you get three microphones on the snare. Like they really took a lot of care and you can, blend the three mics. So you got a, a top mic, 
which you can actually even select um, between condenser and dynamic microphones. Um, anywhere. So those are the three positions. Everyone get how a snare drum works? Ideally, I'll bring one in sometime and we'll actually do it. So that's how it works. But anyway, um, you need to get the sound of the snare. Um, let me hide others. Um, where am I? So to bring in the snare, um, I, when you top mic a snare, you generally have to give it a really considerable boost um, somewhere in the high end to get the sound of the snare. Um, I'm going to turn on my EQ. Let me bring this down. I hope you can hear the difference. You can, you can start to really hear the crack when you bring this up. Uh, I'm at the end. Let me rewind. The hearing, seeing the fundamental frequency of the snare is really easy. It's very narrow, right? So that really gives it, um, you know, brings out the lower frequency and give, makes it, I would call that the fat range. Um, you might find some energy down here. Ooh, make, let me make that narrower with a Q. Yeah, that's too much. Um, you know, keep in mind too, you got a kick drum beater that's about a foot away from the snare drum. So I don't wanna bring that out in this track. So here's my EQ for the snare. I gave it a little bit of help. Um, I'm sort of wanting even a little more high end on it. Let me see if I can find a little more, a little narrower EQ. Yeah, I like that. It gives me even more highs. I'm up at like 7,800. But careful, because I'm starting to hear the hi-hat in it, too. Um, again, the hi-hat is also just a few feet away. Sometimes um, if I'm having a problem with a hi-hat and um, snare drum bleeding into each other, I've made a little, let me get out of here. Hang on. Sorry, I want to talk for a second. Um, I made um, a thing out of fiberglass um, ductboard. Um, it's just a little panel that's like maybe um, five by six. And I tape it to the side of the microphone so it's a barrier between the snare drum and the hi-hat mic. Um, so you can do things like that as long as you keep it out of the drummer's way. Um, let me go back to GarageBand. Okay, back on GarageBand. So here's my snare EQ for now. Again, a little help in the fundamental for fatness and a pretty significant boost um, to bring out the snare because we're lacking it on the top. But this works pretty good. Um, again, the alternative would be to mic the bottom, in which case um, I'll, I'll have a track where we have this, just the snare mic. Um, I'll bring one in. But in that case, I would really bring in my high pass, like up to, I don't know, 300 at least, because I don't want any lows in that. And, on my fader on my mixer, it'd be very low, but a little, because a little bit of that goes a long way. But anyway, so there's our snare. This is the foundation of our kit. I 
I like that. So um, I did something else here. I'll just show you. Uh, actually, I got to do my. Here's my multi band. Turn it on. A little bit of compression, a couple dB on band two. Sounds pretty good. Okay. Again, it was close mic. It'll really smooth out the performance. A couple of dB on that. Um, Phil Collins, um, does anyone know who Phil Collins is? Um, he cre created this great sound in the 80s. It, it's called a gated reverb. And does anyone know In the Air Tonight, the song? Yeah. Y'all too young. Can you picture, it was really a, a groundbreaking drum sound. Um, I should have this queued up for you, but I'm sure. Let me, let me just queue up this song. In the air tonight. Oh, hang on. Let me share my screen with you uh, of uh, my desktop. Let me go to YouTube here, hopefully. We may get an ad here for a second. I don't know why I'm getting this spinning thing. Can you hear the drums now in it when it's playing? Yes. It sounds like a cheap little uh, a magic genie <laughs> from an old organ, living room organ. <laughs> um, There's another great song that has that, Hall and Oates. I can't go for that. It sounds like they used a little toy. But anyway, the drums are, real drums are about to come in. Let me find them. I mean, we are what three minutes in the into the song, and we don't even have the drums yet. Let me. Oops, they're about to come in. Sorry, everyone, it's kind of loud here. Here we go. Anyway, I hope you hear that. It was really a groundbreaking sound. I mean, they don't sound normal, <laughs> right? So check it out sometime. Um, the way they found this sound is um, in, in the recording studio, they have a talkback microphone on the mixing board. And it, it was hooked up with a noise gate. So in the control room, when they talked, as long as their voice was louder than the threshold, it would open it up. This way they didn't have to, you know, do a button, um, you know, to unmute their mic to talk to the people in the, in the studio. They had the thing routed so the reverb return was somehow going through the noise gate. And what happened is when 
they would trigger something that had reverb on it. In this case, they were recording drums. Um, the reverb would come through on the drums, but as soon as the reverb crossed a threshold uh, and got quieter, it would cut it off abruptly. Anyway, so that's what this effect is called. It's called a gated reverb. If you find old effects processors, they have a dedicated button for it. And it, it sounds great on wimpy snare drums. Um, are you seeing my garage van now? Yes? Yes. OK, so we can, I set this up you know, manually in my software when I want it. And I'll, I'll have a track that has my um, reverb on it. And I'll literally put a noise gate after it. So as soon as the reverb tail starts to get a little quieter, my noise gate abruptly shuts it off. You can achieve a similar result. Um, and I use this Platinum Verb plugin that comes with GarageBand. Um, it's under the reverb settings and it's called Platinum Verb. Um, and I'll, I'll show you this and you can have some fun with this. Um, the settings are important. Um, actually, I'll, let me play this and turn it on. Here's the parameters in here. You have a pre-delay. It's how long the reverb waits to do its effect um, on a signal. Um, the reverb time is how long the tail hangs there. I have it really short now. It's like 0.9 seconds, so just under a tenth of a second. It's almost as short as it goes. Yeah, I guess point. Um, 0.5. Oh. So this is really long. I hope you can hear the difference, right? So you really have a lot of control over it. Um, the high cut, this is reduces the high frequencies above 6,000 is what it's set. Um, you can adjust that. Spread is a width of the stereo image. I haven't really experimented with that much. For the dry signal, this is, um, it lets you control the reverb versus the, um, how do I say this? This is how much of the unprocessed track runs through um, the daisy chain of these plugins. Um, I wanna keep it at 100%. And then this is just dials in the amount of reverb I add to it. Let me rewind a bit. So zero is nothing. Um, Hundred percent, you can hear this quite a bit, and you could make it reverb only if you wanted. So that's reverb only. But anyway, for this effect, I, I just want to fatten up the snare a little bit. So I'm going to give it a really short reverb. So I'm setting this at 51% I'm liking right now. So anyway, experiment with that. Um, you know, Phil Collins used it on the whole kit in this in, in the air tonight. Um, so that's my snare drum. Um, I'm going to shut these off um, on my overhead. Let's do overhead right. Um, I recorded these at a really low level, um, you know, so you can see how I made up for it. It's just that all I can say is there was a lot going on in the studio. I was doing it alone and I was trying to play at the same time. So um, I, I just made a mistake and I didn't get a high enough level. 
So it's super low. Um, I realize G GarageBand has a plugin for this. I, I've never, I've never used it. Let me try using it. I'm going to make a little room here. I got my EQ um, there, but I think it's called Specialized. I got to find it. Um, it just boots. Oh yeah. On the bottom, it's under utility and it says gain. So um, it, it just adds a little extra level, I believe. I'm going to give it like, I don't know, 8.2 should be all I need. But I'm going to bring my fader down because this could be a lot. You see my recording thing is on. I'm going to shut that off. Yeah, actually, 10 dB works. You know, it's really low. Everyone get what I did there? Yeah. Okay. Channel EQ. Um, so in my overheads, on overheads, I generally don't want the kick in there because um, I've got plenty of kick drum. I've got a, you know, a good mic on it. So I want to use these to bring in um, the sound of the kit, which will get some snare and hi-hat. Um, I don't believe he used the cymbals, but I would generally use a high pass in this. So I'm going to turn that on and I'll bring it in at least a hundred. <laughs> I'm bringing it in almost to 200 and I hear the my kick drum kind of really disappearing at least the low part of it. I was curious why there was low energy here in my Yeah, there he hit a crash, actually. Um, I'm going to, I generally brighten my overheads a little bit, and the high shelf works very well for this. I just want to listen to this. Oops. I want my snare in there and kick, too. So I bring in a little bit of the overheads. I mean, this track is mainly just kick and snare and hi-hat. Um, let me listen to this a little bit. That's pretty good. Um, it's hard to do in GarageBand, but sometimes, uh, you know, the the kick drum mic is about six inches away from the beater and the overheads are like maybe eight feet. So there's a difference in arrival time. Um, you might want to really zoom in on your waveform if you can and adjust the, you know, the position of the tracks so they line up. Um, or at least check it for phase and uh, invert it. I mean, you'll, if it's really bad, you'll hear a difference. Um, but anyway, um, I don't want to take time and see if we can do this in GarageBand. Um, let me just check my plugins on this. I got my gain. I got channel EQ. Multiband. Let's check. 
a lot of engineers really compress overheads. Um, Let me do this. I'm going to solo my overhead here. I'm at the end. Rewind. So um, I got about 3 dB of compression on it now. We'll add a little reverb later. Um, I'm going to do a similar setting on the other overhead. I'm going to make room for my gain control. Oops. So that was in the top position. Utility, gain. I had plus 10 dB on that. 10.7 will do. Wow, quite a difference. Um, it sounds real boxy because I, I, I haven't brought in the, you know, the setting I had. I think I had my high pass at just under 200. I had my high shelf. That's pretty good. See how this is matching up. That could be good. Um, I don't, might not need them that high. In fact, I might bring them in a little bit. We'll solo with the snare. So that's sounding pretty good. Um, how's that going, everyone? You with me? Um, so question? Yeah. Um, so your two overhead mics was over the drum, the whole drum? Where I, I'm kind of lost in that. I mean, where are they physically? Where are they physically? And you're going to match them up. So, I mean, like all of your EQ settings, you wanted them identical then? Not necessarily. Um, but you know the yeah they should be really close i think you know if you use the same mic and everything um these are sitting about eight feet over the kit in a six feet apart okay um i i position the overheads depending on the drummer's style and you know what they're doing in that song. Um, you know, I want I want them to capture the sound of the kit. Um, if I'm doing like more of a jazz drummer that's really using the ride cymbal and things like that, um, you know, I'll have make I'll have a mic on that, um, and I may move the overhead lower so it's closer to the cymbal. Um, yeah, but that's the image of it. Uh, did I answer your question? Yeah, because I was just wondering why, um, yeah, why you needed so much gain to, to add. Uh, just because uh, I, I had the preamp too low when I recorded it. Um, I can't remember why. Um, but anyway, it's not good, uh, um, and we're compensating for that. But it's it's not a fatal mistake. Um, but anyway, it's not good. It, it 
at least the overhead right, uh, the, this track, really, I can you just see on the waveform that it's quieter. Um, but I, I'd have to listen to this. My spe I'm behind my speakers in this room, so it's a little hard. But um, but this this is sounding pretty good. Um, if you um, you might want to check it out with a little reverb too at some point. Um, actually, I'll do that. Um, Let's look at our reverb setting for this. Um, let me give my, I know I'll want a little bit on the snare. At the end. I don't want too big a room on this song. Uh, just for the type of song it is. I'm going to shut off my input. Um, but let me look at my master reverb setting. I hit the master button. I hit the effects button. I hit the master reverb button here over in this. Um, I like to bring back the vo overall volume so it gives me a little more headroom in the, in the sliders. Um, up there. The time is pretty short. Yeah, I think I did something with this already. But check yours and see if yours. Uh... The way I listen to this is I listen to a hit and then I hit the stop button. And you can really hear the tail. Um, some of you had, um, I, I made comments on something you submitted that your, your reverb or echo time was just super long. Uh, but, you know, make sure you check for it like this. So I listened to, again, I listened to a hit, then hit the stop button, and I listened for the tail. And you can really hear what it's doing and the tone of your reverb. I like this. It, it really has a sweet sound, but it's not too big and it's not going to um, muddy things up too much. Um, I might give a little bit of this on my overheads. Let, let's really listen to it. Here's my overhead right. It's pretty quiet. I'm going to turn it up. Yeah, I'm there about 20%. I'll give something similar to my left. That sounded pretty good. Um, Hi-hat. This guy is really heavy handed with the hi-hat. Um, so it's bleeding, it's all over my overheads and snare. Um, when I have that, um, I'll use the hi-hat mic just for a little crispness. So on this mic, I used, I used an AKG 451 mic. It's a very small condenser microphone. It has a really nice really sweet detailed sound. Um, here's the hi-hat. Let me get back on, on the track settings. Shut off my input, close that. Um, I'll, let me set up my channel. No plugin. Plugin, channel EQ. I I don't compress the hi hat too much, but um, we'll bring it in. Have a look at this. Here's my default setting. Um, 
let's listen to this. Go to my EQ. Wow. Kind of quiet. Let me bring it up. Yeah, you can see uh, you can see where the energy of this. It's all like in the five k range. Um, really, a lot up there. All this stuff is kick drum bleeding onto it. I'm going to use my high pass and really bring this up. Um, so I use this just to add a little bit of really sheen and high frequency clarity to the hi-hat track. No need to boost it. I mean, there's so much, you know, high frequency stuff from this mic. Um, but I, I would, um, I keep this really low um, and it just adds to the overall drum mix. You can hear it. So ex experiment, experiment with the level of that, you know, and just bring it into taste, but you don't need a lot. And it's just, uh, I often use it just to enhance, you know, like I said, the clarity of the hi-hat. But anyway, I left that up there too much too. Um, are you all making adjustments here? Are you going to come back to this? Um, am I going too slow or fast? You're doing fine. It's okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I'd bring in my bass now, you know, get the rhythm section going of the band. Um, I hope I didn't rename my bass track by mistake. Darn it. Oh, there it is. Um, let's solo the bass here and see what we got. I'll actually make it next to the drums, too. Um, this was recorded with a direct box. Um, no effects or anything on, at all. Let's get rid of that noise gate, get rid of the compressor. Um, if you want to have a little fun, you know, with the bass amp plugins, you can do that. Um, I'm going to do this first. Oh, shoot. I didn't mean to do that. Channel EQ, A multiband. Default. Let's EQ this and see what we got. Um, a lot of low end on this in there. Um, this song is in E, so I really. Um, you know, I see that node popping out. Um, let me rewind. I'm going to bring that note down just a little bit. Oops, we're on a different chord there. So let me get my zoom out of the way. I'm going to bring down just a little of the low end here. That's too, that's too wide. Bring that a little narrower. I just want to focus on the snap of the strings. That 
that's pretty good for now. That was easy. Um, this is a good start. Let's get the multi band going. Um, band two. That's sounding pretty good. Um, so that's without, uh, you know, the bass amp plugin. So this should be working pretty good with my drums. That's pretty good. I'm going to do a save. I haven't done that in a while. Save as. One. I'll put today's date, 10-16. Um, moving on, I would do a guitar now. We got the guitar riff, right? That's this. So this is a, you know, a clean guitar. This was recorded through a Fender amp um, with an SM57 close to the speaker. Um, do I need to do any picture of this? Um, my, I um, okay. My titles for those tracks are different. So what do you have? Oh, I'm in the same boat too. It's like guitar, guitar two, guitar three. Yeah, I renamed him on the first day we did this. Okay, so it's guitar fifth, one, guitar rhythm two, and guitar ID three? Yeah. Yeah, why don't you, let me spell this right, riff. Riff. So, yeah, if you want to get these, so we're on the same page. This is the riff, this, you know, the signature. Okay, that's the guitar riff. The, the guitar rhythm is the funky strumming part, this. this. Okay, and then guitar LD it's like a solo track that goes through the song. Um, where's it here? So this one has some distortion on it. Okay, so rename those tracks if you want. We got the riff, we got rhythm and the lead. Um, Set up this channel, no plugin. Um, channel EQ. Oops. Multiverb or multi band. Two band. Let's do the riff first. See what's going on in the EQ. Hmm. Well, let's get rid of the hot, um, some of these lows. Um, I want to just, this has got to just be really tight and punchy.
there's really a interesting hole here in the e in the frequency response. You know, at about at about thirteen hundred. Um, I'm going to zoom in on that. I'm just curious why. Um, using my Q control, moving the mouse sideways, sideways, I can make a narrower band. Yeah, um, there's some good stuff right in there. Let me go back. Um, I don't want all these lows either. I'm, I'm going to just try bringing this down. Maybe we'll we'll use the high shelf. See what can use that just a little bit. And I'll split the difference. One two. Curious what's up. Yeah, I just want to get a little more clarity in this upper range. Um, just a little bit, I can hear a difference. Um, something like this, it'll work. Um, multi band. Pretty good. Um, little reverb, maybe. Couple of mistakes in there. <laughs> Never noticed that. That's pretty good um, for now. Did you want us to do the guitar a certain way, or were we free to put like effects and pedals on it? Um, yeah, Ethan's asking about putting uh, effects on it. Um, I probably I forget in the how I did it. I probably I might have used a little bit of chorus or something. Um, I'll do that. Um, I'm not sure if it makes a big difference. Um, I'll, I'll put the chorus after the multi band, but let me just show you how to do this. Um, uh, you could try an amp if you want. Um, I went for the pedal board because I, I just felt like making the whole song feel a little more grimy, I guess. Yeah, I wouldn't add a lot of I wouldn't add distortion to this part, um, but you get the pedal board, and you know this is what guitarists love all these little toys. Um, one of my favorites is the the heavenly chorus. You could try the retro one too. You just drag them in, and you can make a pedal board. We could bring in a second one too and just compare them. Here's the retro chorus. I'll shut it off. Here's the first one. Um, I've been listening. The retro chorus or the octave? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Wrong one. How do I get rid of this? Drag it over back to the other pedals. Thank you. I've been listening to the classic rock station, you know, lately. I forget which number it is on the radio. And uh, one thing I notice is in all these classic songs, uh, I don't tell you what it is, uh, Fleetwood Mac or Aerosmith, um, the sounds are, are actually really processed. I mean, they really do stuff to the sounds of every instrument with effects and pedals. Um, 
and it really gives like a signature sound to the song. So, um, you know, it's nice to have a good sounding track and these are pretty well recorded, but they're really dry. Um, but um, so many songs, you know, classic rock songs have just a lot going on in pedals and effects and delays. Um, anyway. So it's basically your preference as a performer. Well, for sure. Yeah, it's your preference. Um, so if I mix down, it would be my preference as the, you know, the, the engineer. Yeah, I mean, as far as this, you know, but these pedals, like for guitars, this is what, I mean, this is the, this is kind of a real fun plug-in, you know, the pedal board, you know, they have, it has a really cool graphic. It kind of makes it look like some of the classic pedals. So uh, when they come into your studio to record these, these um, guitarists, will they be plugging in, do you let them use their pedals and then you EQ all of that? Depends on the guitar player and what they have. I mean, if they come in and they they really have worked on their sound, sorry. If they, you know, if they've really worked on their sound and they have a pedal board, that's an important part of their sound. Um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of some of the players, you know, I mean, like if, I mean, I, I'm like if, God, Willie K. like if Willie K were still here and he came in, he's got a pedal board with lots of stuff. Um, Niels Rosenblatt, you know, good guitar player, he's got a pedal board stuff. Um, I would, I would run the stuff, you know, that he has as part of the sound. I would definitely record his pedals. And it would be on a not just like straight flat you wouldn't adjust anything at all and probably eq very little at the end um you know if if he's going through an amp um um you're miking the amp i i mean i would adjust the amplifier so it so sounds the way i like um you know, and these plugins that you see, let me get back here. Like if you go to the guitar amp plugin, I mean, this is, they're, they're what guitar amps look like. And um, let me just shut this off for a second and go back. Like you have a pedal board and then you go into an amp. I'll do amps and pedals. Um, amp designer um from the graphic this is like a vox ac30 amplifier um model and you know they have a bunch of these small brown face um this would be a fender um shoot i can't think of the name of it um It's, a, it's actually a bass amp that uh, I think guitar players really like. Um, this is another Vox. But anyway, you get the idea. You have the amplifier has um, tone controls in it. How come I'm not hearing it? Um, I meant to ask again, did you mic the amp or did you are they recorded direct in what did i do here just a second um i lost my guitar riff track i don't know what i did shoot control z control z yeah there we go i did something to it um yeah i let me bring that back in i'm sorry say that again liz did you, when they recorded this, did you mic the amp or did you plug them directly in? I did all three guitars and I went, they all were recorded with my amp. In my studio, the way we did the session, 
we had um, we had the drummer in a separate. Uh, I have a separate drum room in my studio. Well, you've been there, Liz. I, he was in the drum boot, the room. Um, the bass went direct, so he was sitting out in my control room, and then I I played the guitar. And I have a smaller room in my studio that I, I use to um, I use to isolate a guitar amp, or sometimes people that are loud and obnoxious, I stick them in there. So my amp is in there with a microphone on it. I just I just shut the door on a cable. It has a, a very thick soundproof rubber seal on the bottom. So I listen to my guitar amp from the control room. So it's isolated um, from the drums. And I like that because what I hear is what I get. Like you can be in the room with your guitar amp and you hear the amp, but you don't necessarily hear what the microphone is hearing. You know what I mean? So th this way I can, and really, a mic I want you to see when we do microphones that just an inch or two, an angle, makes a huge difference uh, on the tone. And you can really need to take time. Um, you can really control the tone of the guitar amp by how close the mic is to the cone or the edge of the speaker. Um. So um, I think some of these amp designer plugins actually let you move the microphone too, and you can really hear the, the, um, the difference. Um, some of the ones I have, like from the Waves and in Digital Performer, um, you know, really allow you to switch microphones around. But we'll look at that actually. I, ho I hope I answered your question. Um, But you know, a lot of guitarists these days are using pedals um, that have amp simulators in them, you know, like, and they, they model, you know, a Marshall or a Fender or a Mesa Boogie. And, you know, how well they do it, I don't know. But anyway, it's uh, for those people who are really happy and they have an amp model built into it, and when they perform, they don't use an amplifier, but they go right into a mixing board. Um, like there's local guitarists I work with, like Craig Solderberg and Nino Toscano. Um, you know, these guys have, you know, these pedals. Um, you know, they go, they're just, they don't mess around with the guitar amp. And probably a lot of places they play, like restaurants, wouldn't let them use one anyway because they get too loud. Um, anyway, so Ethan, what do you? Should we? Do you mean uh, like getting up, a, a, getting a guitar amp going? Well, I have the uh, different pedals on the guitars, the three different guitar tracks. And yeah. I have the pedal on the bass track. But anyway. I, I don't, I'm not sure there's a need for an amp simulator on this because I'd already went through an amp. If for some reason uh, the guitar amp, like in the studio at the college, we, we have a sound system and an interface made, made by a company called Universal Audio. It's pretty high end interface and they really put a lot of work into modeling these plugins, and uh, we you, we bought or it comes with ten free ones you can choose. We got a couple of of boutique type guitar amps, you know, that are made by hands, you know, by these amp gurus. Um, do they sound good? I don't know. I, I, I'm not. I'd rather. I like the real thing. I don't think it comes close, but I have, uh, I own three guitar amplifiers and they're, they're a selection of classics. One is a Fender, I've got a Mesa Boogie and I've got a Marshall. And so I have pretty much got it covered of all the classic sounds of guitar amps for the last 
50 years uh, are there. Um, so I really like amps. Um, but anyway, these are a quick way to do it. But you can mess around with that. Um, let me shut that off. You're OK with me putting pedals on? <laughs> Oh man, how did I do that? I must have hit these. Everybody on the pedal board. Stop. Man, that's obnoxious. Let me just try this once more. Let me turn it on. So, um, yeah, you could use a chorus. Um, let me get a setting that I like. So I got to rewind here. So this is setting. Um, um, what the what a chorus does is it adds a a delayed signal. Um, that's generally pretty short, like um, under 50 milliseconds, 50 thousandths of a second. And it modulates the pitch of the delayed signal. Um, the controls for that, the depth would be how much it changes the pitch. So, and you can get some. <laughs> I hope you can hear the difference, but uh, experiment with it. But chorus is a hugely important guitar effect. It's on all these classic rock songs. Um, the cousin of the chorus is the flanger, which is basically the same thing, except it uses shorter delay times. Um, Originally, the flanging effect was done with tape recorders, and um, they would have they would duplicate the sound on a second reel of tape, and somebody would physically put their hands on the reel and slow it down a little bit. Um, and it, I'm trying to think of some effects. Um, I should look for some sonic demos. Like, listen, look up Steppenwolf Magic Carpet Ride. <laughs> so this is a song out of the 60s, OK? They put a flanger on the whole song in the middle. Um, a lot of these effects were influenced by drugs, I think. <laughs> What's the difference between chorus and reverb? Oh, OK. Well, here we go. Are you getting what the chorus does? I can imagine the sounds that I've heard, yeah. This is the chorus. Um, I'll rewind. Um, the rate is of the modulation this is missing a couple of controls. Usually they might have a time, which actually varies the, the delay. Am I, do I have my garage band up here? No, you don't. Oh, OK. Thank you. Yeah.
Yeah. Um, the depth, uh, it, again, is how much it modulates it. Um, the rate is how quickly it does it. So, so it, gets, it gets pretty bizarre. Um, gen I generally like a slower rates unless you want a special effect. Um, feedback feeds some of the delayed signal back into the input of the processor. So the feedback, like if you listen to early Van Halen, um, you know, he used the flanger. Um, I'm trying to think of a couple songs, but anyway. So anyway, the chorus and flanger, they use a very short delay. They modulate the pitch of the delayed signal, and it really gives a very pretty sound. I don't know if you hear it so much. It's really nice on like slow strummed chords too, on things, okay? So Liz, then what's, what's a reverb? A reverb doesn't modulate the pitch generally. Um, there's many different kinds of reverbs. Um, it's kind of fun to talk about. Um, you know, the, the idea of the reverb is to add a whole, a lot of space to the sound, like you're in a big room. It's to make it sound like you're in a space when you're not. Originally, um, one of the first reverbs was called a plate. And let me share some stuff. I, um, I didn't really prepare this. But I, I think I can find you some picture the, of these things. I'm going to just do plate reverb. And these were these big pieces of metal. Um, This is cool. You can even buy this one on Reverb. So there's a metal plate hanging inside of this cabinet. Um, sometimes they would stick these things in the basement of the building or the parking garage, you know, of the recording studio. And they feed a signal and it starts the plate vibrating. Um, and then they have a microphone on it and they mix that through their mixing board, the, the vibrating plate sound. If you look at any effect now, like that has reverb, like on your mixing board, it probably has plate settings, you know, and they're generally very full sounding and they can be really long too. Okay. So that's what that is. It's simulating this. Um, there's other ones that were made out of, of oil cans, you know, that would vibrate, that they would excite. But anyway, they were mechanical, and, you know, and they would basically stimulate, um, you know, some physical thing that vibrated like a gong or a plate and, you know, mixing it with this. Um, the guy who really is known for these things, his name is, was a producer named Phil Spector. Um, and uh, he had this wall of sound, as they called it. And uh, like if you listen to the old Righteous Brothers or, you know, recordings like that, they had a lot of reverb in them. Um, then... Um, Guitar amps have a spring reverb. It's uh, I'm typing. This is a spring reverb. Oh, good. This is a good picture. Are you seeing this on my screen? Yes. Okay. This is what a spring reverb uh, is. 
And this thing sits in the bottom of, a, you know, of classic guitar amps. Um, and it's essentially the, a similar idea to the reverb plate, but the, you have a setting on the amplifier that sends signal into the springs and it starts the springs vibrating. And then there's a separate pickup on the spring and it blends that in with the sound. You've all heard the classic sound, you know, the song Wipeout? Yep. It starts off with them kicking the amplifier. And, uh, and it, it, it makes the springs uh, shake. Um, anyway, so anyway, originally these reverbs were you know, vibrating physical things and you blend them back into your music. Um, then they started coming out with the digital reverbs, um, which is probably like 30 years ago. Um, and, you know, you'll have these settings too. And I think I have the article on the website, but it was a guy named Gerzon. G-E-R-Z-O-N, and he was a mathematician who was also a classical musician. And he had this idea that you could um, reproduce the sound of physical space uh, mathematically, describe it. And it got more and more complex and he developed these formulas for um, you know, physical spaces. And he started working with this company Waves, um, which is Israeli company to do models of physical spaces. Am I giving you more of an answer than you want? Oh, but, good. Uh, I like that. Okay. But um, one of the main companies that started um, doing a digital reverb, um, which was all electronic, was um, I think Lexicon, I remember, was one of the first. And uh, they're still in business. Um, you might even have a Lexicon setting on your mixing board. You'll still see it. Um, and these were coming out in rack mount units. Um, oh, this is a real fancy one. Um, this is the controller for it. I could bring in some of these. I've got a bunch of all, you know, different kinds of rack mount reverbs, but this is a, a modern one, the Lexicon PCM 92. Um, as you can see, they're not cheap, um, but you can really reproduce a huge variety, you know, of physical spaces with this thing, you know, from the Grand Canyon, a cave to a small bathroom, the surface. Um, and then they have, you know, digital models for these. Oh, I left an important one out. One is the chamber, okay? Like uh, Capitol, Capitol Records, in Hollywood was well was known for their uh, reverb chambers. So they would build these um, rooms underneath the studio in the building. I own a, a plug-in for this too. Um, I'll show you this. Um, Hang on, I'm typing in a search and it's slow. With all the plugins that you have nowadays, do you need those extra processors, like the Lexicon processor? Um, hang, wait, let me show you this. This is an image of the of the Capital Studios plugin, which I own. 
Um, this is what the interface looks like. Let's see if I can bring it up. Um, are you seeing this? Yeah. So this is the room. They have speakers in the room. The speakers reproduce are get are work off an auxiliary sends on the mixing board. Um, they had microphones in the room to pick up the sound of this hard surfaced room. Um, these are the controls of the plugin. You can you in the real one you can actually drag on the microphones and move them around. You can select which type of microphone um, you want to use. Um, I have another cool one, um, and that's a model of the Abbey Road Studios, you know, where the Beatles owned. Let's see if I can find an image of that. Um, Yeah, this is Abbey Road Studio plugin. So this is the room itself, and they could change the surface. This is the tiled one, and they had all of a complex array of cylinder baffles in it, and you could move the microphones around. Um, this was an actual delay line they had in it. So anyway. Um, Liz, a reverb doesn't modulate the pitch, but it, it does a complex calculations on reflections. Okay, like the sound of bouncing off walls. Um, like the longer the, the bounce is, the bigger your ear will perceive it in size. Does that make sense? So the actual what's going on under the hood in reverbs is there's a you know complex early reflections, um, and we can bring in like some of the waves plugins I have that um, you know give you control over the early reflections, and then there's larger ones and you know they get pretty complicated as you know these calculations the sound bounces around. So really, it's it's really a bunch of delays, I guess, you know, in its most simple thing. But some of them are really short, and then there's longer ones. Uh, but one of the Waves plugins, um, I forget what it stands for. It's called the IRL. Um, let me Google that. Those are created differently. Um, stop. Um, I'll 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 prepare some demos. Um, the Waves Company actually has some really good. Uh, you know, videos and demos on some of these things. And I, I think you'd get something out of it. I'll try, I'll sort through it and do a little presentation on them. But I'll just say the, the other one is the IRL, or they call it a convolution reverb. And those are done by actually measuring the, free, the response of the actual physical space. So they go into some great church in Europe, you know, that's known for its fabulous sound, or there's one I like that's called the Sydney Opera House I have. Um, you know, there's another a synagogue in San Francisco that's really big and it has great sound. So they go in these rooms and they, they blast out a burst of pink noise Pink noise is the sound, um, basically it's 20 to 20,000 hertz of all frequencies. And then they measure, um, they measure the response of the room. Um, 
with microphones. I forget if I said that right. They, they have a speaker, they send out a burst of sound, and then they measure um, from different places in the room what's happening in frequency, in delays, and they've got all this software to analyze it. And um, basically, it works backwards in your studio. You apply that same algorithm that they created um, to your sounds, and you basically blend it in with an auxiliary sender insert, and you got the Sydney Opera House in your studio. Okay, so that's another kind of reverb. Um, you know, again, it's a digital one, and it's a mathematical model, but it's based on a real physical space that was measured. <sighs> That's my answer to that. Would anyone like to take a little break? I've been talking for like two hours. Yeah, break is good. <clears throat> yeah, let's take, I was talking to some other people who do long classes and they say, sometimes it's okay to do a longer break. Um, so let's, let's take like 15 minutes, is that okay? And then we'll continue on. So if you want to keep working, you know, try to apply some of the stuff I've been talking about. Okay, it's um, 1117. Let's resume at 1130. I'd really like to hear some presentations. If you're absolutely not ready, um, I really want to start it and, you know, and uh, if not today, then definitely next week. Okay, I'm gonna pause the recording now. Okay. And uh, I can find where it is. And I'll, we'll come back in at uh, 11.30, okay? Good. So, Koa, you know, if you could bring up your projects that you've done on the stuff we're working on, I think it would be better. Otherwise, yeah. you know what I mean? It, it's just a little weird for you to talk about a project they don't know. Okay. Um, well, you did want me to do in a real world, so. I did, yes. I, I adjusted the volume. Okay. Um, had a few questions about it, too, so. Well, let, for now, let me work on that just with you directly, okay? Okay. And I'll look at it and I'll give you comments on it. Yeah. Um, Is there any other projects aside, besides um, the ones that we're working on? Yeah, I'm doing some more. Are you ready for another one? Yeah. Okay. Right. I'll put one together for you. Okay. Um, Are we back here, everyone? Liz, I pulled up um, wait, let me get my see where I am in my screen share. <clears throat> Liz, I pulled up, a, I, I installed the program I really like on this computer. It's called Digital Performer. Um, this is a really typical, you know, reverb plugin, a pretty simple, it's fairly simple, but it, it sounds pretty good. Um, I don't have any audio in it right now, but these are the settings that you'll see. Um, so you got a, a pre-delay. Um, and you can control that. Um, it's in milliseconds. This is how long it takes for um, the effect to kick in. 
you know, once it receives the signal. Um, you might call this an early reflection, you know, and other, um, other types of effects. And this will give you an initial perception of the size of the room. The decay, um, I'm not sure what meaning this number has. It's really just on a scale of zero to a hundred, but it, it probably defends, depends on the setting. Like I have a big one here, a cathedral, and it has a lot of presets. As you can see, guitar plate, you know, small dark room, then there's some special effects, um, surf guitar. Um, diffuse would mean how much it's spreading, you know, other reflections out in the room. Um, this control here would be a, a basically a low pass. Um, so it's going to cut off sound above 11,000 here, cut off sound above 3,000. So it's, uh, like I said, it's a low pass, high cut, yeah, cut off for the high frequency. Reverb level, um, this blends the reverb level. Um, oh, actually, this is in dB. Um, I guess you can boost it if you want to for some reason. Um, and then this mix control blends it um, um, in with the dry signal. Okay, so um, I inserted this on a channel. Um, and if you were doing that, you could blend in the effect like that. If you had this on an aux send bus, you would keep it at 100 and then just control uh, the send to it. Okay, if, you, if you're interested in this, I, I can put together Actually, I don't know if I have all my wave stuff here. Um, I'd have to record it at home because I don't have all my special stuff on this computer. Um, it, it's kind of complicated, you know. They're they're so they're really concerned over their authorizations, you know, that you pay for it and that people don't steal it. So they have kind of a complicated authorization scheme. But anyway, I don't know if I covered, um, you understand the difference between reverb and delay? Okay. I yeah. think so. Okay, yeah, a delay is just, it, it's a more discreet echo. I mean, you can hear it pretty much in GarageBand. I'm gonna close this. Um, So anyway, um, if you want more on that, um, you know, we can do it. Let me close some of this. So does anyone want to present or should I keep talking? I'm not ready to present today. Okay. Um, I just downloaded everything. All right. Um, well, I'll keep talking then. Where am I? Um, let me get my program back up here. Um, I actually like that sound. Uh, I can't find my garage band. There we go. I like that chorus. Um, moving on, we have our rhythm track. Let me set up my channel, no plugin. I got my channel EQ, multi-band, 
bring in my default setting. Let's look at our EQ. This sounds pretty good. I, I like, you know, it's no accident. I mean, the, the EQ, you know, setting on the amp was deliberate. Um, it might be a little bit too thick in the low end um, once the bass is there and everything. So I'll bring in my high pass. I'll try the, a little bit of the low shelf there. I just want some clarity on this. Again, you can really see how a guitar speaker rolls off at 5,000. There's really nothing going on there. Um, if you want a little brightness, you know, you can give it a little bit of a peak, you know, in that upper range which is going to be like 2 to 5K. Sounds pretty good, though. I like the tone. A um, little reverb on it, just a hair. Set a little uh, compression. It's the end. Let me rewind. So, um, you know, I want you to understand what happens when you over compress stuff, too. Like, um, you know, just experiment with this. Like, you know, bring it down so it's way too much and then back it off. Once you get a point where you no longer really hear it compressing, but it's uh, really sounding smooth, that's a good way to do it. So a good way to set, you know, effects like this is go too far and then come back. Let me push this one out back up and let's work on band three. Um, So you can hear, you can hear what happens. Oops, you can hear what happens. I hope when you over compress it, you really start to lose some of the highs. Um, so you might want to like come down so it's way too much. As you, I'm going to bring it back, and you'll hear the highs um, coming back to it. Um, and. Uh, once you reach a point where it sounds natural, but still a little compression, it's probably pretty good. Um, when I do guitars, um, the attack time of a compressor is really important. I, I think we set this initially a, a while ago. Um, and if you open up the details in the multiband, um, I want to set this. What is this reading in tenths of a second? Yeah. Um, a lot of times the attack times in compressors are super short, you know, like 15 and 20. But for guitars, it, you don't want to cut off the pick attack and, and make it too short. So I generally go like around at least 50 milliseconds. And you can do this, um, you know, inside the details. Um, I believe it affects all bands, um, all four bands of it. Um, whereas other uh, multi-band compressors, you could do attack time individually for each band which really makes sense if you think about it, like the lower frequencies would need a much slower attack time because they just take time to bloom or sort of like the low note of a bass guitar. 
it's not even going to begin to form in 50 thousandths of a second. Um, anyway, I can show you that at some other time. But let, let, let's make this a little bit longer here. Bring that. So I'll bring it back. Sometimes it won't stop when I'm zoomed in like this. But anyway, I like this. I mean, this is a really dynamic part. Uh, you know, it's real percussive. And uh, I brought it down and then returned it till it sounded pretty natural. Um, I'll do them this band. It seems like I'm really low here. In this setting, am I? Guess that's right. Yeah, I guess there's not that much going on in this lower frequency. Uh, um, I guess because of the way I use the high pass too. Almost done here. Okay, so I'm happy with that setting. We could go for a little bit of a pedal on this too. Chorus. Let's bring in our pedal board. Amps and pedals, pedal board. Get this so I can see it. Let's find something good here. Any suggestions? Well, I don't have anything else on this. Yeah. Is grind a distortion? Um, I think it's up at the top. The pedal is second one from our right from our top row, I think. This one? So. Is it an overdrive? It sounds like an overdrive. Yeah. <laughs> Name. Yeah, I don't want an overdrive. Um, Um, the squash is another compressor. Um, auto was are pretty cool. Let's see what this one does. I'm going to Get rid of the grinder. I like this. This is pretty funky. So this is based on a Wawa pedal. Um, I don't know if I can, you'd think they'd have one of those in here, but not an, oh yeah, there's a wah. I'll, I'll look into that. I, I, I haven't tried it. I don't want to waste your time, but this is pretty funky. Um, yeah, this is great. So this is the kind of stuff you hear on, uh, this is a good effect. 
I like the setting I have too. Um, but you could follow this too with a, um, a heavenly chorus would be nice. Let's bring in the retro chorus. Try this one, much simpler. Just right in depth on this one, right? Depth is... Um, that's pretty good. This is going to sound great. Um, let's leave the lead out for now. Um, I'm not sure how much we want to do that. So, um, we've got drums, bass, a couple guitars now. Um, I'm going to stick my guitars up next to the bass, okay? Um, reorder these so it's convenient. Um, let's push this around now and uh, we'll see what we got. So you can start, you know, getting a foundation for your mix. You know, this is really, um, the guitars, the bass and drums really carry the song. Um, so again, I'm just gonna push these around. Um, So I like my, this is starting pretty good. I noticed my master level though is um, I'm at zero dB and I'm already well into the yellow. So uh, I want to be a little careful. I maybe nudge everything backwards a bit because um, I got some vocals and other things and I don't want to overload the master bus. So I'm sort of creeping up here. So this is a good time to just do a little reset. This is getting there. So this sounds pretty good to me. Um, I think I showed you the, the B4, which is the organ. Um, Pretty strange sounding track. Um, but we have a little touch of reverb on it. But again, we'll set up our channel. The plug in, channel EQ. I'm not sure how much compression this needs. Two band. So the low stuff in this track is not needed, you know, the lower frequencies. Um, so there's really not much going on under 200. Get over there. Oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong track. Couldn't figure out why I was seeing that. Let's get on the right track. Do that again. 
I'm going to shut off my input here. I don't want that open. That's what I want. Austin. So I got my high pass here. Um, I'll use the low shelf. That kind of does it for me. I think just bringing out some of those lower, those really low mids helped it. I don't want to boost a lot on the high end because this could get really harsh, but it's. But you can have a little reverb on a track like this too. Um, check out my multi band. I'm going to bring that up to about 300 because I, oops, I'm at the end. That sounds pretty good. I don't know if we need an effect on this. Um, the clavinet I talked about last week, it's like a harpsichord. <coughs> Am I going too fast or is this okay? Can I turn this in to you? Mm -hmm. Is there a stapler? Is there a stapler? Yeah. Um, you can just set that here. You're going to take off? I am. Okay. Am I going, uh, is this getting to be too much? No? Okay. Um. So here's uh, a Montclavinet, right? Yes. Let's look at our EQ on this. Again, we don't need lows on this. We've got plenty of lows with our bass. Um, we use a little bit of our low shelf on these lows again. Clavinets are basically like guitars, really, um, at the same range. They're strings. But I want to. I want a little bit more clarity in this. It's kind of roll. I think we could even get away with some chorus on this. So I'm going to do the pedal board. I really like the retro chorus was pretty good. Simple. Let's try that. Oops. I like that setting. So uh, let's let's bring in the B4 and clavinet. Bring in everybody. Let's hear what we got. So I actually have to work. 
research in an hour. Uh, is it right? I'll leave a little early. Yeah, go ahead if you got to go. Um, you all good with the assignments we have? And um, yeah, just a microphone chapter, yeah. Yeah, that's for next week. I want to say I think all papers are graded now. Um, in the grade book, I've been putting comments, um, and I write questions that are wrong instead of two. Okay. <laughs> Sound pretty good. I like it. Okay, so we got, um, I don't know about the saxophone or the lead guitar. They're just kind of frills, but uh, I think we're ready to look at the vocals. I'm kind of more than halfway through the track, so at this point it's it might be easier to mute things than to solo things. Um, I take that back. Um, let's listen to Barney. Um, there's Barney one and Barney two. Let me bring them together. Um, so let me solo him to where he sings. Once I was a funky singer. So I, th I went over this last week. So this is a, an, um, I forget why we, I did this like 15 years ago, maybe more. Um, I think we knew we were going to double track it, you know, for a, a more, you know, depth. So um, basically these are two separate performances. Um, I'm not sure we knew what we were going to do with it at the time. But they're fairly lined up. Um, when I double a vocal like this, here I'll play it. I was a funky singer. Let me bring it up. Playing in a rock and roll band, but I never had no problem. Okay, so um, we want to balance this out, and there's a few things to fix in it. Um, when this is really pretty tight, like he, he really did a good job at um, keeping the two performances in sync with each other. Um, we can pan them pretty far then. It, it gets kind of weird when things are a little off. You'll hear the offness. How do I say that if that's a word? You'll hear them as being more off the wider they're panned. Okay, so there's no rule for how much, but the way I do it, and this is true for guitar, you know, any parts that are doubled, you know, for a, a, a more thickening or fuller effect, the tighter they are rhythmically, the further you can get away with panning them, which I, to me, enhances the effect that I'm going for. Um, but still, I want to use this, but there's some things in Barney's performance that are just out of time. And I think it's, it's good for you to take a little time surgically fixing that. Um, one thing that really pops out is when you th um, things are drastically off balance. For example, the opening, his opening, whatever this is. Hey! that thing. We only have it on one track, you know, so it's just a little weird for your listener to hear it coming out just the left speaker. So ideally you'd have it on both tracks, but since we don't, we have to do this. 
I'm going to highlight that waveform. I'm going to do a command T. I'm going to highlight this one, command T. I want to make a copy of this. Um, I did the beginning part second, so I'm perfectly lined up with the wiper. I've got this highlighted. I'm going to copy it or command C, but you could do that. Now I'm going to go down to the track number two and I'm going to do command V or you can do it up here, paste. So now we have an exact copy of it exactly in time. So you'll hear uh, it's balanced now, but let me get my zoom out of the way. Here, I'll, I'll zoom in on this a little bit. Okay, so you'll see. Hey, yeah. I mean, it sounds like one because it's absolute. It's an absolute clone of itself, right? Um, when I have this kind of thing, um, I'll really in. I'll slightly delay one of them. Um, I'm, I'll delay the second one and just make it a hair later. You see how little I'm moving it? And I, I don't want it to be noticeable, but I want it to sound like two. Hey, yeah! I could even go a little more. Um, you can grab it anywhere and just slip it a little bit. Let me just listen. Hey, yeah! That's pretty good. Um, it, it, it gives me a little more of the thickening effect, and now I'm balanced. But at some point, you can go through the track and clean it up and listen to sync issues. Once there was a funky singer. So that one's off, okay? Um, let's try and... Once there was a funky singer. Yeah, that, let's see how to fix that. This is going to take a little doing. Um, can you see this okay? Is it too small? Um, it's okay. You see that? Yeah. The phrase, once a funky singer, once there was a fun it is off. When I look at it, I can see that this one is a little bit late. Uh, at least the first part of it is. I'm going to try and improve this. Um, I'm going to split this and see if I can shift this a little bit. So I'm splitting it before and after that. Actually, I didn't. I don't want to split it there. Hang on. The first word is good. It's the second word that's not good. I want to highlight this command T. And can you put, I can... um, your little editor on on the bottom. Hmm. Can you put your little editor editor on in the bottom? Can you click like click the scissors? So I can see like okay. exactly what bar you cut at. Once there was a funky singer. Okay, well you can see that, but what I'm doing is I want to see it relative to the waveform. I want to match it to the other performance. Mm -hmm. Um so in, in like Digital Performer, I could do an editing window where I could look at any two waveforms enlarged, you know, but seeing one doesn't help me that much. But I'll try and go in on this one and really zoom. I'm going to split it here. So this is the section I want to move. I think 
if I bring it forward a little bit, it'll really help it. Oops. The first part is good, but the second part might be early. Let's listen. Once there was a... Once there was a... Ah, this is tough. Once there was a... It's better, I think. The funkies. That's good. There was a funky singer. Actually, that's okay. I think I helped it. But you can, you know, listen to the part. There was a funky singer playing in a rock and roll band, but I never had no problem. This is pretty good. Burning down the one night stand. So yeah, he's really did a good job. Um, We'll come back to this, but anyway, you know, take your time and there's a couple other places where we have a, a real imbalance, like some words and um, a couple of syllables are missing. But let's EQ Barney. Um, go to my track. I, I don't, I'm going to close my editor. I don't want to pitch shift him or anything. Um, bring in in my plugins. Plugin. Oops, it's my multi band. Two band. Let's look at our EQ. Oops. Okay, I didn't mean to do that. Now everything around me got to stop the feeling so low. Then I decided quickly. So this is pretty good. Um, I'm not sure this needs a lot of EQ. We can bring in our high pass. Let's not... just go down and check out the show. And they were dancing and singing. We'll. I think we'll use our multiband. You know, sometimes he's got a little bit of low, lows that pop out, but um, we really want a little more fullness. Um, but I think he would benefit from a little bit of sparkle. Let me give him a little kick in here, just above 5K. I want it a bit narrower. And move into the groove and, and just run. It hit me, somebody turned around, they shouted, play that funky music, white boy. Little wider cue. Play that funky music, boy. <laughs> I'm going to use my multiband now. <clears throat> play that funky music, white boy. So we can move this, uh, our crossover point over, because this the issue with the low mids is around lay down that boogie and play that funky music till you die till you die oh what's going on they shouted play that funky music Hang on. play that funky music Play that funky music. Okay. Play that funky music. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna kick this up a little bit higher. Work on band two, rewind. Oh, <clears throat> then I decided quickly. This is it. Let's over compress then back and off. Check out the show. And they were dancing and singing and moving to the groove and, and just when it hit me somebody turned around am i on the right one here no i'm on barney one sorry i wasn't hearing anything happen <laughs> let's try that again hang on i gotta redo this i gotta redo this he shouted play that funky music white boy Play that funky music, boy. 
<laughs> to my shutter. Hey, that funky music, white boy. Lay down that boogie. That's it. Play that funky music to you, guys. Right? Jay Okay, now I'm done. They shouted, play that funky music. Yeah. Play that funky music. Play that funky music. Play that funky music. I'm gonna rewind Play here. Oh, then I decided quickly. Yes, I did. To just go down and check out the show. And they were dancing and singing and moving to the groove and, and just went and hit me. So this is pretty good here. Um, you know, I went too far, then backed it off. Um, but it's a pretty dynamic vocal performance. Um, Somebody turn around, they shouted, play that funky music, white boy. But uh, I don't think it's over compressed, you know, it's, it really is punching through pretty clear. Um, let's do Barney too. Oh yeah, so we're all set with that already. Multiband. Oops, let me play it. Play the right one. Um so I'm hitting this compressor a little bit harder than I have like some of the other songs. It's just really dynamic. Um, I want to be sure not to, I'm going to make my attack time a little, a little slower too. I want to make sure this gets through, but we want to really keep it. Let me rewind. And down the one night stand, now everything around me got to stop the feeling so I low. Then I decided quickly, yes I did, to just go down and check out the show. And they were dead. So that yes I did is only coming out of one side too. So we got to fix that. Um, You could give him a little delay on this too. Um, what's this? And singing and moving to the groove. That's reverb though. When it hit me, somebody turned around and shouted, play that funky If Barney won the same amount. Play that funky music, boy. Play that funky music, right, boy. So this is good. I think we got good EQ and good compression on the vocals. Um, you know, you might want to experiment with some. Uh, we haven't used um, echo or delay at all yet on this song. Um, I'm sure I did on the original one. I'm gonna go find a phrase and work on this, see what we can do. Burning down the one night stand. Yeah, yeah. Now everything around me. Got to stop the feeling so low. I don't want like a real long one like that, but uh, let's get into our master one. Effects, master echo. So I'm going to experiment with the time here. Actually, I'll, I'll pull back the master. Oh, then I decided quickly yes, I did. to just go down and check out the show. And they were dancing and singing and moving to the groove and, and just went and hit me. 
Somebody turn around and shout and play that funky music, white boy. Play that funky music. I like that. Music. So it's a, it's pretty short. Play that funky music, white boy. Lay it down and boogie. Sometimes in parts like this, I might use a different setting, but in order to do that, you can only have one master echo in GarageBand, but you'd have to put it on its track. Um, you play that funky music to you, well. <clears throat> There's some, you know, listening to the classic rock, there's, there's some singers that always have this doubling effect on them. Um, Phil Collins always does. Um, he has these sh really short delays. Um, Ozzy Osbourne always does too, um, if you listen to it. Um, voice. Yes. Um, I should write down and bring up examples of all these things for you. Um, they shout and play that funky music. Play that funky music. So yeah, I, I like this, you know, at least right now we can revisit it. Um, but this really short, it's a pretty short delay. It helps to thicken it up a bit too. Play that funky music. Play that funky music. Play that funky music. Let's get to our backing vocals. Um, well, what's the difference between Master Echo and on the track? Oh, and on the track? Ko is asking, what's the difference between the master echo and what's on the track? Um, the master echo, you know, is set up as an auxiliary bus. Okay. Right? And the slide, the echo slider that you see when you like highlight an individual track sends it to the main effects process processor goes through it and it just blends it in with the master output but the thing is all the tracks are going to share that same setting oh, wow. okay. okay but if i'm saying well I'll, um like when i mix I'll, i often have two different delays i have two and two reverbs i have a longer one and a shorter one so if you want to, if we wanted Barney to, to say, have a slightly different reverb setting, I'm sorry, let me go back and share this. Um, you'd have to, um, you'd have to do it as an insert. Um, like this. So, um, under Barney's this, um, I would go to the the delay. Um, I, I don't use these too much. L let me look at the tape delay and see what we get. Yeah, again, a pretty crappy interface. Um, but actually, the controls are good. Um, let's listen to it. I'm, I'm going to solo. I'm going to turn off Barney one. Um, hmm? yeah, it's a lot. Um, when I'm setting delays, I turn them up, you know, they're way louder than what they would be, you know, and I can really hear the timing of them. This one, you know, is in time, uh, with, with notes in the song. Um, let's go to an eighth note. This will make it shorter. Um, I'm not sure I'm liking this, but just some of the controls, uh, you know, we have a low cut, 
which I would bring up, high cut. You can really bring back the highs on, um, on an echo or a delay too. So I want my dry, let me rewind, see if this will work. Resting around me. Got to stop the feeling so low. And I decided quickly. Yes, I did. So a little goes a long way. I'm at, I'm bringing in 8% um, of the wet stuff. Um, this is a nice effect. We should, we'll have to look at this on another song. Um, it's a tape delay. And the difference between tape delay and echo is that old tape record. Um, I think I showed you this. Did I ever show you the echoplex? I think so. Yes? I Does anyone remember the echoplex? I what don't do remember. This is worth showing. This is the mother of, of, of echo effects. And it is. I think I showed you this. Um, I'm bringing up my browser. I'm going to show you the, an Echoplex. So it's a tape loop, and the, it's a tape recorder. It's a pretty good picture of one. Here you could buy one for $2,000. So the tape is going around in a loop here. Um, the tape, the record and play heads are movable. The, diff, the distance between the record and playhead sets the delay time along with other things too. So if it's gonna record the sound on this head, the tape goes through there and then gets played back there, the time it takes for the tape to move from there to there is gonna be your delay time. Mm. Pretty cool, huh? Um, there's other adjustments like the total speed of the tape, but these things had, they were really unstable. Like they weren't consistent in their speed, even when they were set. And so the, the tape is actually, what gets recorded actually has its own pitch modulation that's just kind of variable. But it added a beautiful chorusing effect to the delay. Um, and it's just really musical. Um, but uh, this, there's different versions of this, but that's an, uh, the Maestro Echoplex. And this is, uh, I remember when people started, you know, using this in concerts. Um, the first guy is a guy named Jean-Luc Ponty that was a violin player. Anyone ever hear of him? No, maybe they, um, he was doing this really spacey instrumental music, but all this stuff, you know, from the 60s um, and 70s, you know, was tape delays. But this is was this was the first effect till they were digitized. Um, Does that give a better sound? Hmm? Does that give a better sound than the digital? Does it give a better sound? Um, in my opinion, no, I mean, I mean, it introduced because it was tape and, you know, the tape gets used over and over again, right? Thousands of times it, I mean, the sound really gets seriously degraded, you know, in it. And then there's hiss. Um, uh, one of my favorite they have it, I think, in GarageBand was the, um, 
I got the the electro harmonics memory man, which I believe they still make. And this thing, it was analog, so it wasn't. Yeah, this is it exactly. Great effect. Um, but anyway, th this the controls on this also. Um, This is a new version. Yeah, but the depth of it um, is a pitch modulation too that you can, it's very controllable. Uh, and this is gorgeous, really nice effect. Um, anyway. Let me go back to this. My garage band. The disco down and check out the show. And they were dancing and singing and moving to the groove. And just when it hit me, somebody turned around and shot. You generally won't hear these um, like pitch modulation effects on a vocal um, unless they get super extreme. Can anyone guess why? I'll tell you, because vocals are inherently really out of tune. Um, you know, there's there's just the nature of the human voice. Even someone that sings in tune, their voice actually has like a vibrato and pitch modulation built in. Otherwise, you'd sound like a robot. Um, so. Um, you know, it really takes a lot of chorus or flanger and, you know, pitch modulation effects, you know, to start, you know, hearing it on your voice. Um, like I said, because, but this is pretty cool. Uh, we'll see. We got a little. And it play that funky music, white boy. Play that funky music, boy. I'm going to back it. Play that funky music. This thing a little goes a long way on this tape delay effect, you know, just a few percent, I can really hear it. But uh, let's live with this for now. It's kind of cool. I'm going to do this tape. Um, let's bring in our group. The group was three or four people all around the microphone in one room. We did two takes of it. Again, we wanted a real group effect here. And this is it. Oops. Is that one person? Give me a boy. Lay down and pop. Play that funky music till you die. Yeah, I still hear a lot of Barney in there on this track. I hear it on this one. Um, I'm rewinding here. Make sure I'm too zoomed in. Let's get back here. I want to get back to where it's. Uh, here's where they. Here's where they come in. Dancing and singing and moving to the groove and just when it hit me, somebody turned around and shouted. Um. I don't know how the sound is on your end. Um, it's just pretty intense in some frequency range. Let's try and look at it. Group two I'm on, right? Music till you die. Wow. Yeah, there's a lot going on in this. Um, I'd start with a little high pass. I'm going to set up a loop here so I'm not rewinding all the time. Sorry, this will be a little obnoxious, but 
it's faster. I'll just start where they come in and just do a little of this. Dancing and singing and moving to the groove and, and just when it hit me, somebody turn around and shout and Um, I'm gonna try bringing this down here just for a second. Dancing and singing and moving to the groove and, and just when it hit me, somebody turn around and shout and play the funky music, white boy. I guess it is what it is. Um, I'm not going to be able to change this too much, but hopefully the double will thicken it up. A um, little reverb. Yes, yes. And singing and moving to the groove and, and just when it hit me, somebody turned around and shouted, and play the funky music, white boy. Play the give funky it a little. music, boy. Play the funky music, white boy. Lay down the thuggy and play that funky music till you die. Dance it. And singing and moving to the groove and, and just when it hit me, somebody turn around and shout and play the funky music, white boy. Play the funky music, boy. Play the funky music, white boy. Lay down the boogie and play that funky music till you die. So this is a really dynamic, uh, um, section, you know, there's really a lot of punch and they enunciate really strongly. Um, so I've hit it a little bit harder with the compressor. Um, just, I'm, I'm, it'll sit in the track a little bit better, but I don't think I've squashed it. Um, so, you know, I like this setting I'm at, um, I'm at minus 46 on band two and minus 34 on band three, so 46 and 34. I'm going to duplicate that on the, uh, the other one. Let me do that real quick. Minus, what did I say, 46, 34, that's weird, the numbers aren't moving when I do that, anyone notice that? Yeah. Dancing and singing and moving to the groove and, and just when it hit me, somebody turn around and shout and play the funky music, white boy. It's working now. Dancing and singing and moving to the groove and, and just reverb. when it hit me, somebody turn around and shout and play the funky music, white boy. That's pretty good. I think we're pretty far along. Let's give it a listen. Um, so this is a good basic foundation for the mix that, you know, at this point, it's just fine tuning some of the levels. Um, let's unmute all this stuff. Um, shut this off. Oops, get out of there.
I'm going to keep the, there's no rack toms. I'll leave the helicon effect out for now. We got clavinet. I still have my sax and lead guitar off, but let's see what we got here. They were dancing and singing and moving to the groove and it just went, it hit me. Somebody turned around and shouted, play the funky music, white boy. Play the funky music, white Play the funky music, white boy. Lay down and boogie and play the funky music till we die. I can't hear it too well. I'm kind of behind the speakers, so I, I don't want to, it's pointless for me to tweak it when I can't hear accurately. But anyway, this is a pretty good start to it. Um, covered a lot. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Comments? You're muted. It's a lot. <laughs> That's all. Well, we, we've covered a lot, you know. Um, I mean, the old overview, the thing to see is that your mix is really the sum of a bunch of little steps, you know, and they're all important. Um, you know, you need a vision for the whole thing. Um, you know, you know your tracks, and then you need a, you know, a vision or a, whatever the hearing word of vision is, um, of how it all needs to sound, how it can fit together, what the role of each track is in the, you know, what the role of each track is in the song. Does it have a purpose? Maybe it doesn't. Yeah. In which case you should get rid of it. Like, I think we're going to get rid of some of the saxophone and lead guitar. Um, they just really clutter it up and they're not needed. Um, you know, you should understand that, you know, in a song like this, the drums and bass are really the foundation. You got to get them right. Um, if they're not right, you're, you'll never get the song right, um, or it'll be weak. Um, but we got some good punch on the bass drum. You know, uh, we had a good opportunity to use a noise gate. Um, you know, we EQ'd the snare. Um, we used the Phil Collins gated reverb effect on it. Well, we made one that was sort of like it. Um, you know, we did some pretty just subtle EQs. It doesn't take a lot, but it, you know, just sort of shapes things uh, and you really fine tune stuff. I mean, we got a lot right in our tracking, too. It was not an accident. Um, you know, there was some settings that it was recorded with. But compare it to, um, you know, the original. I have a copy of the Wild Cherry, which is what we're trying to copy, more or less. Um, but anyway, I, I hopefully there's a lot for you to learn, you know, in this, you know, try using the, uh, I really like the way the guitars came out with a little of that, that chorus stuff and the auto uh, on the rhythm part. Um, this one, really. I mean, it really adds a nice motion to it. You know, it makes it move and change. And like when I listen to, like I said, when I listen to really good mixes of these classic rock songs, they all have stuff like this in them. 
you know, effects and, you know, stuff that's moving and changing, you know, it's very dynamic. Um, but listen to this kind of stuff. And, you know, even if you're listening to contemporary, contemporary R&B and pop, you know, start listening for this stuff and the way they're mixing it. And, you know, now, you know, that we've covered a lot of these things, you, you know, try to, you know, hear it in the mixes, you know, of stuff that's out there. Um, the echoes, the delays. Um, I mean, more con contemporary pop production is different than classic rock. A lot of it is in the vocal production, you know, where you have all these layers and people talking and you know, little ad lib things and dubs and but anyway i you know start listening with a different kind of ear you know to, and start picturing how the mixers put it all together <clears throat> so anyway uh once you get into this i hope it'll I hope you learned something out of it. Um, if you want to contact me during the week and like share what you're doing, you know, I'm, I can do that. Um, but I don't know how much time you need on this. I, I I'd like to do some presentations next week. It's really too much for me to just talk for four hours. I'm surprised you're not all asleep. <laughs> But anyway, uh, you know, if you want to, I'll put up the Zoom recording if you want to review anything. I'm good. Okay. Sounds good. So, yeah, the microphone assignment is there. Um, I'll, I'll give some thought to what I can do to enhance, you know, your study of this, uh, of the mics, but... It'd be kind of nice to be hands on if we want to come in in groups or something. Um, <clears throat> like work on it in groups? Yeah, I mean, or something. Um, you're not going to hear that a lot of it is subtle and, and you're not, I don't know if you're going to get it through Zoom. I don't, um, I mean, especially when you start working with good mics, they all are going to sound really good. They're just mm -hmm. going to sound good in different ways. Um, mm -hmm. That's nice. Anyway. Um, You're losing your voice. You need to take a break already. No, I'm tired. I'm, gonna, I'm done. So anyway, I hope you got something out of today's class. Um, Thank you very much. But we we covered a lot. Um, okay. Anything else from anyone? Okay. I'm going to sign off then. Bye. You okay there, Luke? You've been quiet. Oh, yeah. I've just been following along. Okay. Just, uh, changing stuff as we go along. Well, good. No, you're doing good. You're, you're, the stuff you're putting in sounds good. Thank you. Okay. All right. You know, try to get your assignments in too. The stuff, you know, that's missing. And if you're having a problem with it, let me know. And okay. All right. Have a good week, everyone. All right.